Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be alive here at Faith Life Church. Glad you are here. And let's welcome our online campus right now. Good to have you all with us. We're so glad you joined us today. We're going to have a great day in the Lord. Worship's good, isn't it? It's always good to get together, I'll tell you that. It's, uh, there's no substitute for it. Even online, sorry. It's just not the same. So I want to say you need to, it's good to gather together. And the Word of God says to make sure we do that. That's what it says. Hey, well, this is a great day. My new book just came out. You probably saw it in the foyer coming in. And I'm going to uh, touch base on that today. And as you know, there is a series of these books. There's one more left in the series of five. And it's going to be called The Power of Generosity. This one's The Power of Provision. And if you have not read these books, I'm not trying to sell books. I'm trying to get information to you, all right? So understand that. But The Power of Provision is a great first book, if you have not read any of them, or a great second book. I took a lot of the questions we had over the last few years from these first three books and clarified a lot of things in the, second, uh, the fourth book. So it's going to be helpful. And I'm going to teach out of chapter five of that book, Power of Provision, today called Empowering Your Provision. That is the title of that chapter. And I think most of you probably know our story of being financially illiterate, in debt, dysfunctional for nine years of our first married life. And when I say dysfunctional, I mean dysfunctionally depressed and not doing well. You know, it's hard to, I always say financial stress is slow death. Hello. This is, is this the first service or second or first? First. Okay. You got to wake you up, right? Uh, slow st- stress, financial stress is slow death. You're held like in a cage. You can't do anything. You can't dream anything. You're just surviving. And they're stressed with that. But you know our story, nine years, uh, having panic attacks and antidepressants, 10 cre- uh, canceled maxed out credit cards, two junk cars with payments still on them, IRS liens. We owed the dentist. We owed the, the dry cleaner. We owed, uh, borrowed tens of thousands from our parents and uh, just basically survived. Uh, how many would think that doesn't sound fun? And it's not. It's hell on earth, to tell you the truth. It's, it's hell on earth. You say, why would you say that? Because that's the curse. That's hell on earth. That's the curse. And so we cried out to God. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but we got to to the place. We cried out to God. And he said to me that you're in this mess. He said, like he said this, he said, it's not my fault. You know how many Christians say, I wonder why God's not, you know, where's God? He's not doing, you know, you ever, someone say that? Yeah. Well, it's not his fault. (laughs) That's why he said that. Because he didn't want, he didn't want to get my theology messed up. He wanted to make sure he, I would know where the thought that the problem is, which is on my end. It's always on our end. Just make sure you know that. He said, you don't know how my kingdom operates. And uh, again, we didn't know what that meant. We had Bible school, five years of college, Old Testament degree, anointed, holy, baptized the Holy Spirit. But we didn't have a clue what he meant, kingdom. And so he gave us this scripture, Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. Now, the thing we had to become, what I I tell people, is you need to become a spiritual scientist. You need to dump the religion, you need to dump what you've learned in the past, and you need to go to the Word of God. And you need to become a spiritual scientist, which means you ask questions. See, these stories are not written that you go, oh, Jesus is amazing because he has given you that same authority, and he has given you that same spirit, and he said the same things you see me do, you will do. So you need to ask how. Yes? Amen. I'm going to prime you today, man. First, first service, so you always got to get it going a little bit. Coffee's just kind of coming into play here, you know, so by the end of the service, you'll be fine. But, it, <laughs> but uh, so our lives changed. We began to uh, ask God to teach us what he meant by the kingdom. He began to teach us. In two and a half years, we were completely debt-free. He began to pay cash for cars. Uh, we built our 7,600-square-foot house. It's paid for. And you say, well, you're bragging. I'm bragging because I need to brag. Because you need to see evidence. I could stand up here and be in debt and tell you how great it is to be free, you know, what God says about debt, but I am free from debt, and I'm telling you that I'm trying to help you see evidence. Nine years, don't you believe I tried for nine years? You got to be kidding me. Something changed, paying cash for cars, developing businesses, able to give thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars away. Friend, it is a completely different lifestyle. And you need to be asking, how did that happen? 
I'm telling you, you need to ask, how did it happen? Because I'm not that good, and neither are you. <laughs> That's why I wrote the books. So we became spiritual scientists, and my goal was to put this whole process into these five books. Now, I'm going to teach you all again, chapter 5, Empowering Your Provision. Our key scripture today is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. You can probably quote it. Remember this, Paul was teaching this church here in Corinth. Remember this, which tells you he has taught them already, right? He's, he's reminding them. This is, this is 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. He has taught there. He is reminding them of a principle. He says, remember this, whoever, and you are whoever, sows what? Sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Now, this whole concept of sowing financial seed, we didn't make it up. It's right there in the Bible, all right? Paul has it written right there. But we do have a problem because Christians read this, and yet they don't know what it means. You say, well, I, I know what it means. It means I give. No, the, see, you don't know what it means. See, let's talk about that. Whoever sows, what does it mean to sow? You have to define your terms if you're a scientist. Sows, what does that mean? Where do I sow? What do I sow? When do I sow? Well, then it says reap. What does that mean? Where does that happen at? How does that happen? Do you know how most Christians interpret that scripture? If I give, it's going to show up. But you have forgotten that sowing and reaping are verbs. Guess what? You have part of this process. It is a process. It is a process and it is kind of abbreviated in this, this, this sentence here, but yet you have to know how to do it. Sowing, where at? How much? What am I sowing? What am I sowing for? What does the harvest look like? What am I expecting? Where do I reap? What tools do I need to reap? How do I reap? What does it look like? I mean, I could go on, right? A farmer is a good illustration. The natural law kind of mimics, you know, uh, duplicates the spiritual law. A farmer doesn't just throw his seed out there. I mean, that wouldn't produce much, would it? Well, let's say a farmer doesn't know anything about sowing crops and you hand him a bag of corn. Do you know what he would do with that? Let's assume he knows nothing. And you hand him a bag of corn. Do you know what he'd do with it? Someone said it over here. He would eat it. Do you know what so many people do? They eat their seed. Because they don't know the process. See, a farmer's confident. He throws hundreds of thousands of dollars into the ground every year. Not because he's discouraged, but he's happy to do it because he is confident in the process. Sowing is the beginning of the process. There's cultivation. What do you sow? Your harvest. He has a clear picture of timing, harvest season, preparation for the equipment, which is different than the planting equipment. He has the combine. He understands the whole process. He knows the markets. He knows why he's planting. When he's planting, he has a whole plan. But Christians have a mailbox mentality that thinks, well, God is just going to make it happen. No, he makes it grow. He makes what grow? What you sow and what you harvest. And so you have to know the process. So I spent a lot of time in this book covering this and helping people understand. The book lays out the five steps God taught me how to bring harvest into my life. And so, again, it's in the book. Now, it's, I'm going to start on one of the steps, just one, which is in this chapter. And number one in the five steps is uh, sowing. You know, you got to sow first, right? you gotta, you got to sow the seed. In Tulsa, Drinda and I, we lived in Tulsa, of course, went to Oral Roberts University. We had bought this house, and we thought we'd be, uh, you know, miniature farmers. What's the term for that nowadays in the city? What is it? Hobby farmer. Yeah, hobby farmer. And so we had this uh, little spot out in our yard. We thought we'd plant a garden. So we went to the trouble. We tilled it up and planted our garden. We anticipated that we'd have all the vegetables there on the picture of the package, you know, and kind of thought that'd be great. And as summer went by, nothing happened. I mean, these little plants popped up, and that's about it. And then had a little miniature corn plant about that high, a little miniature withered up little start of an ear. Our neighbor came by one day and was talking to us and uh, it laughed at our garden. He said, yeah, we, what's wrong with our garden? He goes, duh, you planted it in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> you 
You see, knowledge is important when, you, when you're sowing a crop. It certainly is. Now, there's several types of giving in the, in the Word of God. Uh, first of all, if the Bible talks about sowing. It's talking about sowing into the plans, purposes of God in the earth realm. Now, number one type of giving is called the tithe. You, you've heard the tithe. It's 10% of your gross income. And the first thing people think is, well, I couldn't afford that. No, the reason you can't afford that is because you're not tithing. See, this is a law. Like gravity, it works every time. But we need to dis- explain this. So many Christians have the tithe kind of messed up in their thinking. They've heard wrong teaching. Because a lot of Christians heard that if I tithe, God's going to open the windows of heaven uh, so, and he's going to pour out all this uh, harvest that I can't contain. Anyone ever heard that? And how many, I mean, I'm a pastor. I've talked, trust me, I've seen people quoting that for years and years and years and not happening. Anyone else see that? It's okay, you can be honest here. I know people say, let's find another church pastor's talking against tithing. I'm not talking against tithing. I'm just talking about people have been taught wrong concepts about tithing. If we look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, let's read it. The Bible says, bring the whole tithe. Israel was not tithing the whole 10%. They were tithing as they thought they could afford it. Bring the whole tithe. This is a law. Like an airplane taking off. You know, let's say it lifts off at 80 knots and you're going 60. Well, you're kind of getting there, but you're not going anywhere. (laughs) Because the law of lift only operates at 80 knots. And so if you're going to tithe, you got to tithe to 10%, then the law works, right? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Remember, the Levites received their pay, their food, from the nation bringing the tithe in. So in his house... That there may be food in my house, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough. Pastor, there it says it right there. Right? It does. We'll talk about it. But where's the blessing at? In the mailbox? Where's the blessing at? It says right here, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. The fungus, the disease will not destroy your crop. What you plant is going to produce a healthy and bountiful crop. What does it mean when it says open the floodgates of heaven? He's talking to an agricultural society. Guess what it means? It's going to rain. It's going to rain. I'm going to make sure the rains come. Your crops are going to be bountiful. They're going to be blessed. I'm going to stop Satan from stealing them, messing with them. Fungus is not going to destroy them. But understand this, the tithe is a legal fence. Because as you can see, the the benefit of the tithe is from what you grow. Is that what it not says? And if you grow nothing, the tithe is not going to benefit you at all. The tithe is a legal fence that gives God the legal right to stand between you and Satan and allow what you grow to be undeterred and to be growing under the blessing of God and to profit you. I thought I'd get more excitement out of that, man. It's like, if this is true, and it is, maybe you're still reeling about the the, the heaven thing there. Open the floodgates. What's floodgates hold back? Everyone say, water. He's talking about rain. Crops are going to be well watered. But you have a choice. You can plant three tomato plants or 50,000. What are you going to grow? The tithe is just the legal fence. Number two, a second way of giving is generosity. Now, Proverbs chapter 19, verse number one says, if you help the poor, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay you. How many believe you can become very wealthy being repaid? Come on. No, you can't. You're getting repaid, right? Come on now. You're being repaid. You're not getting extremely wealthy that way. You're being repaid, right? In other words, there's a flow happening. You're going to be generous and God's going to give seed to the sower and it, it does increase, but it's, there's, a, there's another part of this equation the flow is happening, but there's another kind of giving that I focus on in my book and what I want you to understand. Now, these first two means of giving are what I call lifestyles. Being generous is not a choice. It's, it's, it's not what you give. It's what, who you are. 
because you have the character of God. Generosity is a way of life for you. The tithe is a way of life for you. You can't name the tithe. The tithe already has its assignment. These are a way of life in the Christian life. These are how you live. But there is a way you can sow seed for increase that we want to talk about. I'm talking about what I call intentional giving that has a specific harvest. It's not the tithe. It's not being generous to the poor. You'll be repaid, and God wants you to do that. I'm talking about when you need a specific harvest, you sow a specific seed. And usually that would happen into a kingdom assignment in the earth realm. So law number one of the five in my book, law number one says this, find some of what you need to sow. So for instance, in the Bible we see that bread always multiplies to? Bread and fish multiplies to? And oil multiplies to? oil and corn always multiplies to corn and so you need to understand this principle so I have a choice I can take some fish I can sow some fish into a God assignment and I'll reap fish but what happens I don't have any fish and I need fish what would I sow what do you think money because money is a bartering system so you name money every day of the week you buy gasoline with money you name it gas you name it food you name it Bread, you name it, rent. You See, money is simply a substitute for actually what you're doing. It's just a bartering system. So I can actually give money and name it fish as I sow it, or I could take the money and go buy the fish and then sow it, but it's the same thing. I can name the money as I sow it. So I'll name the money, and I sow it, and I'll reap what I've sown for. Now, Back in the day, back in, when I first met Drenda, I owned a Kawasaki 1000. Any motorcycle people in here? Uh, Wait, are there no motorcycle riders in here? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, come on now. Had a Kawasaki 1000. That was, I loved that bike. And uh, one day I lived in an apartment, this is before we married, and of course our first dates were on that motorcycle. And one night I walked out of my apartment, it wasn't there, someone stole it. And so, you know, getting married and raising kids, we just didn't obviously have the money for a motorcycle. But through those years, my pastor at that time, he rode motorcycles every year all the time. I would take a check once in the spring and write a check to him. And I wrote on the check for your gas, for your motorcycle riding this year. And I would write uh, ST, Honda ST1300. That was the motorcycle that I wanted. And so I called that money that Honda bike. I did that for a number of years. And, but I had a little, like, little notation next to that, when I have a nice garage. <laughs> so I knew, I, didn't, I knew it wasn't going to show up tomorrow because I didn't have a nice garage, right? I didn't want a brand new nice motorcycle to sit out in the rain. I didn't want a brand new nice motorcycle being stolen again. So I said, okay, when I have a nice garage. I know what you're thinking. You should have written on the check for a nice garage. <laughs> <laughs> well, that nice garage did show up. So I gave motorcycles away. I bought motorcycles to give. I gave, uh, see, I gave one, two, three to staff members. I had a motorcycle given to me as the pastor of the church. I gave it away. You say, why did you give it away? I thought you were believing for a motorcycle because it wasn't my harvest. Now, catch this. It wasn't, my, it was a good, it was a mar- motorcycle. A nice one, but it wasn't my harvest. And so what does that mean? What is it? It's my seed. God gives seed to the sower. Are you with me? So I gave it away. And you missed it last night. Uh, Well, let me say this again. So after a few years, we had our nice garage. Then uh, someone gave me that ST1300. The 1100 wasn't made anymore. They upped the engine size. And a brand new one. Drenda gave me uh, one for a year there. We rode around for a little bit. But we didn't have a nice garage. And I gave that to my worship leader. But the ST1300 uh, showed up. Which I gave away last night in service. Just by the way, in case you want to know about it. So I've given away. But see, what you don't know is that we said, I said, that uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a Harley. And uh, named it kind of ultra limited. Any Harley riders in here? And of course, there, maybe there's one. Okay. You ride a Harley? Very good for you. Awesome. Anyway, so uh, it was given to me a few months back. 
And so what I'm trying to say is I sowed the seed with a specific harvest. I sowed the seed with a specific harvest. I sowed the seed with a specific harvest. Every seed has a specific harvest. Every seed. See, when you think of car, you don't think of car, you think of a car. Every seed has a specific picture. A specific picture, okay. Now, I could talk a long time about this, but I want you to just trying to get this picture here. Let's go to Mark chapter 6, verse 35. This is when Jesus fed the 5,000. And we'll start in verse 35. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so they can get, uh, go to the surrounding countryside, villages, and buy themselves something deep. But Jesus said, what? You, you feed them. You feed them. Now, he's teaching his disciples how this kingdom operates. Well, he said, uh, or they said, that would take more than a half year's wage. Are we to go and spend that much? And Jesus says something really strange in verse 38. He says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Now, do you think Jesus thought there was enough bread and fish out there to feed those 20,000? Because it's 5,000 men, the Bible says, but there's women, and it's 15 to 20,000 people. Do you think Jesus thought there was enough bread? Hey, go and see. Do you think he thought there was enough bread and fish to feed them? Hello? No. So what was he doing? He's looking for a distinct seed to reap a distinct harvest. Now, see, your, your, your mind should be going, stop everything. You ever heard the records, you know, you know, they stop everything. That should be what it sounds like in here. Because you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They don't have enough to do this. But they end up with a lot. How, how does this happen? Because you're learning how the kingdom operates. And Jesus said, the same things you see me do, you will do. I hope this clicks with you. How many loaves do you have? He's looking for a specific seed. Someone willing to give him the seed. To sow that seed that he could multiply. Verse 39, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. Some versions say he blessed it. He broke the loaves, gave it to his disciples. He divided the two fish, the, the fish and they fed everyone. They were satisfied with 12 baskets left over, more left over than they started with. Now, this is a picture of the kingdom. You have a choice what you're going to look at. You can look at insufficiency, or you can look at the answer, which is the kingdom. But you have to know how the process works. Remember I said you have to have the confidence of the process that Jesus is doing and using that you could have the same kind of results. So we need to understand, to bless it means to consecrate it. Consecrate means to separate. I mean, you're separating it. So we know that when Jesus dealt with the bread and fish, what happened to it? This is old, old training here. It changed kingdoms, changed jurisdiction. It came under the kingdom of God's jurisdiction where God could then multiply it, right? So let me ask you a very distinct question. When exactly did that happen? When Jesus took the bread and fish... Or when he blessed it. Now remember, we're talking about a very legal process. You go to the bank, you sign it. It's a moment in time. You sign it. You can hand it to the teller, and she could say, you forgot to sign it. But when you sign it, it can happen, right? See, again, so many Christians don't understand the process. They think when they give their offering, or when they sow their seed, it's done. But you just told me that when Jesus took the bread and fish, it wasn't done. Is that what you said? When did it change kingdoms? When he said, right? Let's let's talk more about this in Matthew chapter 8. There's a story here of Jesus coming to the Kandarians. Uh, Two demons possessed men uh, met him there. They were violent. And verse 29 of chapter 8 of Matthew, it says, What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, Who's they? The demons. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance away, of course, the herd of pigs, they begged to be sent there. In verse 32, Jesus said what? Go. And they came out. 
I was with uh, Bill Johnson last week, and uh, I, I give him credit for this statement. He said, that was deviled ham. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That's a good word. I like that. But the bottom line is, Jesus is carrying on a conversation with demons. They're not reacting. They're not leaving. Why not? They didn't have to. They had a legal right to be there. They're dialoguing until Jesus, what? Said. What are you saying? You say, okay, so I'm, I'm giving my offering in church, pastor. Great. What are you saying? When does it change? When does it change kingdoms? Okay, every seed has a specific harvest, right? So I spent a lot of time in the provision conference this year talking about giving a directive. So when Jesus was there, notice with the bread and the fish story, that he had all the people sit down before he blessed it. He had them all sit in groups before he blessed it, meaning he knew what the harvest was going to be. So when he blessed it, or some say he gave thanks, what was he giving thanks for? Let's put it in your life this way, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God and the peace of God shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What are you thanking him for? Come on now, what are you thanking him for? So if you're anxious, it says through prayer, that's the vehicle that carries what? Your petition. What is the petition? It's the very specific, detailed harvest result you're looking for. Right? What are you thanking God for? For the petition. Because Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have it. You're thanking him that you have received the petition. Let's just change it to a requisition. I spent a lot of time at provision conference in my book talking about the Lord's Prayer. I believe most Christians have no clue what it's talking about. It's a requisition template. You don't beg. The Bible says you already have the entire kingdom. Why would, you don't need to beg when you already have everything. But you do need a requisition. Heaven, your will on heaven, on the earth, right? You got to requisition heaven. The Bible says you bind, you loose. You lose heaven. You need, you need to requisition heaven. And so you need to know how the process works. So when you sow a seed, when you sow the seed, you need to speak. Because I believe Jesus spoke. He didn't go, thanks, God. He already had a plan. He knew what the result would be. He already had them sitting down. He knew the specific seed he needed for the specific harvest, and he reacted to that entire process with a, an exact preparation to receive the exact harvest that he was believing for, which I believe meant that when he blessed it, he didn't th say thanks. He spoke the harvest. Father, thank you this bread multiplies and feeds this vast multitude to the glory of your kingdom. I thank you, Father, this fish multiplies and feeds this entire multitude to the glory of your name. I believe that's something what it sounded like. He put the directive in that blessing. He spoke over it. He had his petition. He spoke it. Now, it doesn't record that, but I believe it did because he, we saw he prepared for it a distinct harvest, a distinct seed when he operated there. You remember the story of the duck hunting shotgun. I mean, you've heard a lot of my stories, and you'd have to say one thing about the stories you hear. They're always very specific, aren't they? If you're new here, get the book Kingdom Thoughts. You're going to see it, but we've had, they're always specific. The duck hunting shotgun, remember that? You know, I, gun, I mean, I've given 25 to 30 guns away in my life. You know, I have a gun, I have a gun, I have a shotgun, I have a shotgun. But I saw these, heard of these duck hunting shotguns or big magnum shells, camouflaged, and uh, we have a marsh on our property. And I thought, you know, probably like to see one of those, like to get one of those. And I, you've heard the story, I was in Cabela's in January of that year, duck season's over. And, well, sure enough, there's a whole rack of duck hunting guns. And without even thinking about it, again, not even thinking about it, I was walking by, I said, Lord, I'll take that one right there. 
My intent was maybe buy one next fall when the season came around. I told you I went to a, a, a corporate event. I was the guest speaker teaching principles of success at a corporate event. The CEO comes out afterwards and says, we wanted to buy you a gift for speaking. And he handed me that exact shotgun. Now, you should be asking all kinds of questions. Why that gun? You remember Kirsten's dog story, remember? Pomeranian. I've never had a dog given to me. Why was that? Why did that Pomeranian show up? Why did those cars, you know, all the things, you know, all these stories, how did they show up? If you're not seeing that happen, you need to be asking and asking till you figure it out. Because this is the kingdom, how it operates. I told you during the provision conference, I told you for years, how I learned this. And I won't tell the whole story for time's sake. You've heard it many times. But you remember, I hunt deer, and I'd go out, and God taught me to sow my seed and receive my deer. I usually receive my deer in 30, 40 minutes. I tell people I don't hunt deer. I receive them. They always laugh. I say, no, I'm serious. I receive deer. You receive the promises. You don't beg. You receive the promises. They're already yours. They're already yes. You receive them. You don't beg for them. That's unbelief. So this one year, you know, I sowed my seed for a button buck. That's just a young, good-eating little buck, young buck. We, I, I hunt for meat. I like the venison. And went out. And this has been happening for years. I went out. Button buck didn't show up. Went out the next day. Nothing showed up. Now, I stopped right there because I don't hunt just to hunt. I go out to receive. And so I, now, see, most people, they'd say, well, Gary, you can't expect every single time you go out to bring your deer. I know all kind of people to hunt deer. They don't get anything. I mean, you expect every time you go out, you're going to come home with the, the, what you sowed for? Yeah. So when it didn't show up, I know something's wrong. But see, most people wouldn't even think to ask the Holy Spirit what's wrong because they have not even figured this out yet. And the Lord said to me, I was walking out of the woods and I was praying in the spirit. Why would I do that? Because the Bible says someone who prays in the spirit prays out mysteries and edifies himself. Edifies means brings instruction. I said, God, where's the deer at? What happened? Because I know enough now to know it's on my end. It's not God. Something happened on my end to short circuit this thing. And he said, here's exactly what he said. You did not speak over it. He's referring to the seed. When I sowed my seed for that deer, you did not. Now, previous years, we just did it without even thinking. But I was busy that year. He said, you didn't speak over it. And then he took me to this, this story in, uh, about the bread. He said, remember, Jesus took it. He blessed it, changed kingdoms. You didn't speak over it. And here's what I said walking back to the house. I said, I have to do that? Because I thought, like many of you think, if I write the check out and sit it in the offering basket, it's done. I'm helping you today. So I... I Went back to the house, and I, this time I wrote my check out and got drenched, and we spoke over it, and that next time I went out, I got the button bug. But I found that most Christians don't understand the process. They're not speaking over it. So again, this is just a glimpse, how you sow. you got to begin the process right. And of course, where you sow is important. You're going to sow into, in this type of sowing, when you're sowing specific seed, you're going to sow into a specific assignment. And the Holy Spirit will help you with that. But if you don't have that unction on where should I sow at, I always say, again, this isn't your tithe. This is your, your voluntary seed for what you need with a specific harvest in mind. I say find a ministry assignment that has demonstrated results that can come into agreement with you. See, the poor will never come into agreement with you. That's not the purpose of that giving. But when you come into agreement, it, like partners, you partner with God's assignments you sow into an assignment that God either leads you to or has demonstrated results that you know can come into agreement with you. Again, I could spend hours talking on this line, but you get the point. And so I have a, a video I want to show you, uh, Brian and Sarah's story. We showed it back earlier uh, in the year, but I thought it illustrated well what we're talking about. And uh, basically, we, we want you to get this. We want you to understand it, right? Amen. Let's watch their story. I'm a real estate agent. Um, I sell houses for a living. I've been doing it for 19 years. Um, you know, it was great in the beginning. Uh, was pulling in some money, but spending it as fast as it was coming in. So during the recession of 08, we survived it 
but we were not thriving whatsoever. And it about wiped our business out because we had, we had no idea our rights of the kingdom. We didn't know the laws. We didn't know anything biblically about how finances should look in the kingdom. We grew up in two very different households and two very different denominations, but neither of which taught us anything about finances, especially biblical finances. What I remember most is um, I had a deal fall apart last minute, um, getting ready to close it at the table, and it just fell apart. And we were out of money. We didn't have any money left. How were we going to pay our bills? We didn't know how. Um, and uh, me, being the provider of the house, got to go work, I got to do something, I got to bring in some type of money. It was panic mode for us. Um, it was fighting. Yep, fighting. It was striving. Yep, just trying to it get was chaos. through. Yep, scratching at every corner we could, trying to come up with two dimes so we could <laughs> so we could pay our mortgage and stuff. Yeah. And, and it was that mentality of, because sometimes when you roller coaster your whole life um, and you don't have that stability, that you just, you make really, really bad decisions. So we were making bad decisions with definitely how we were spending money, taking out credit cards, getting cars that we couldn't afford, getting everything that we couldn't afford. Yep. And I think it was just to satisfy a deeper need that we had, yep. which was ultimately needing Jesus to be first and foremost. Correct. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we went to church. It wasn't that we didn't have God, but I guess we just didn't, know some of the teachings that God had for us until we started listening. So when we started coming to Faith Life Church about four years ago, um, we had never been taught anything like we've been taught here, and it changed everything for us. Our middle daughter had been through some health problems, and she is completely healed and whole. We learned our authority and that we could take that and that healing was ours, but we did not realize that we could apply that to our business. One of the first series that we really dug into was Pastor Gary's Power of Rest series. And that is what completely changed everything for us, for our business, for our marriage, for our finances, um, for everything. The main things that just captivated me from that series was we always hear that the Sabbath is Sunday, the Sabbath is Sunday, and learning that the Sabbath is 24 seven. It's a way of living. It is living in God's rest because he's already provided and that the Sabbath is a person and the Sabbath is Jesus. And I love the scripture in Matthew of Jesus talking about like, look at the birds. They aren't striving and painful toil and sweat, you know, over what they're gonna eat and drink and all of this, like, will I not take care of you so much more? And that just really, that really hit home that I've been the one causing myself all of the stress. We started asking ourselves, what can we do different in our business? How can we be set apart? Because everybody knows a realtor yep. or 10 of them. So yep. we really started asking God, what can we do different? Like the fragments that the power of rest talks about. Like, where are those fragments? What can we do different? And it really was just applying the kingdom and the promises to our business. He just started teaching us about the power of rest, the double portions, the overflow, and everything just started coming together. That deal fell apart. Next thing I know, um, I put it back on the market. I got a call uh, that people wanted to see it. I took them through it ended up representing them, so I got the double portions because I represented both sides of the deal. And then the overflow was getting to list their house they had to sell in order to buy this one. So the paycheck that was gonna be $9,000 turned into $24,000 within a couple of weeks. He's blessed plenty of my clients. Appraisals came in $100,000 over. Um, so not only is he blessing me, he's blessing my clients, which is blessing our business. Yeah, and during the market where there's multiple offers and people are paying sometimes 30, 40, 50,000 over list price, our clients, they're walking into 50, 50 to $100,000 $100, in equity, which is just completely unheard of yep. during these times. When the realtor personally called him, instead of just putting it on the market, getting multiple offers, going through that whole process again, she called him and said, you know, I want to offer this to your people first. And what she said was, there was just something about you and I, you and your clients, and I just wanted to make sure that they were able to get the first offer in. 
About two months before the COVID-19 hit, the Lord had brought a scripture back to my mind and he just kept telling me to speak, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So I started speaking, no weapon formed against me will prosper, no weapon formed against my husband will prosper, no weapon formed against our marriage, our business, our kids, our property. And I just kept, I couldn't get it out of my system. I just kept speaking it over and over and over. And I kept telling him, I'm like, something, there's a stirring in my spirit, something is happening but I'm completely at rest. Then he started bringing back the double portion reminder to us and the power of rest. I had ordered a hair dryer and they sent me two of them. And then my daughter had gotten a baby doll for Christmas and it was defective. So I had called the company and they sent me two. And then two family members actually gave us cars. So there were three instances right in a row about a month or two before the coronavirus hit that God was showing us and bringing back the power of rest. Going through 08 and all of the fear and the worry and the anxiety that we had, um, this time we just knew it was going to be different. We knew that God was taking care of us. He was providing for us. It didn't matter if there was another re recession, if the economy crashed, we knew physically that we would be fine. We yep. knew financially spiritually, emotionally, relationally, we knew in every aspect of our lives that we were just gonna be fine. My business is essential, it keeps the economy going, um, and he's really blessed us. I'm writing contracts, showing houses every day. Um, still, uh, my buyers are strong, still sellers are wanting to get out. God, he is your provider. Yep. The job in the economy is not your provider. That's not what you need to be leaning on for your source of strength. So just dig in to the teachings, dig into the word, and find the promises because they're all yes and amen, and they are, if they're for us, if he can do it for us, Correct. he can do it for you. That's right, that's right. He can do it for you. But like they said, they didn't understand. And so my prayer for you is that you become a spiritual scientist and you begin to understand the process so you can have a harvest and to know that you have a harvest. And that would be going a long way. Again, our book's out there today. You can pick that up. And uh, let's stand to our feet today. Well, I trust you've been encouraged, and I hope you've learned some things today that'll help you. And I know that you have. But bow your heads with me because, you know, the beginning of this whole journey is to know God. And you would have to agree you need to know Him in today's world, that's for sure. And it's so easy. Religion tries to make it so complicated and so hard that, you know, you've got to do this and got to do that. Now, the Bible says whoever calls in the name of Jesus has the legal right to become a member of his household and a citizen of his great kingdom with all the benefits thereof. So we're going to pray as we always do at the end of service. We're all going to pray out loud. And as usual, I'm going to ask if you'd like to be part of this prayer, wouldn't it be great to face Monday with a whole different outlook of life? And think of the videos you see here at Faith Life every week of people's stories, how they've changed. Well, that can be your story. God's no respecter of people because it's all based on laws, and laws don't change. Anyone can use the laws. So bow your heads, and if you're here by chance, you can say, Pastor, I need a change. I need to know the, the God that made me and can help me understand life. Just stick your hand up really high right now. Yes, thanks. Who else? Thank you in the back there. Who else would say, yes, thank you on the right? Who else would say, hey, I need to be part of this prayer today. I need to know the Lord. Anyone else? Online, you can just tap the screen there with us and say yes. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else would say yes today? We just want to give you a chance to, to know the Lord. And I always say he'll help you unravel the mystery of you because he made you. Let's all pray together right now and say, Father, you said in your Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus, that you would receive me and make me brand new on the inside. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and teach me how to live life the kingdom way. And I thank you for it right now. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. And I now receive your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen.